Now onto the 40k section and the bit that mostly interests me. Let's have a look at the back of the box to see what it says for 40k players. The floor plans in this set are approved by the Inquisition as morally pure and suitable for those with Warhammer 40,000. Captain Flavius Exocullis has personally tested the new rules for fighting on a square grid and guarantees that the plans make an ideal simulation of hive world complexes. The accompanying booklet compiled by Graham Davies and Alan Merritt also provides a complete system for generating hive world gangs and their equipment. Armed with these details, the Legion's Astartes can take the fight against corruption to the heart of the enemy's lair. Page 14 kicks off with a short story about Inquisitor Tharg, accompanied by a captain and sergeant of the Space Wolves, finding a copy of City Block in the ruins of a building. Short story even shorter, the sergeant is executed by Tharg after he tries to play on a tile with a Space Wolves painted Optipolymer miniature uh, before the set can be declared morally sound by Tharg. Um, classic Rogue Trader stuff. The introduction section states that the set can be used with any other system that has a grid system, including the game's workshop dungeon floor plans. Uh, it also says any special rules must be agreed before the start of the game, and if present, the GM gets final say. Also, that the rules in the booklet are a suggested expansion to the mapping option on page 36 of the Rogue Trader rulebook and are ideally suited to a structure that covers the whole table but may be used in smaller buildings if wished. Battlefield suggestions are hive worlds and large installations such as strongholds or onboard a spacecraft. With regard to 40k rules, the suggested systems that follow are concerned with movement and shooting with some notable weapon and cover options. First up is movement. Each square on the board is treated as one inch of movement side to side and one and a half inches of movement corner to corner. The facing diagram shows you the forward side and back facings of a model. You may only move forward. Each model gets a 390 degree turn at any point in their movement. Each additional 90 degree turn costs half an inch of movement, with a 180 degree turn costing a whole inch of movement. And you orientate the facing diagram accordingly. Next up is the movement allowance. Again, there's a diagram to help. The movement allowance is the distance that a model can move after taking into account the reductions to movement due to heavy weapons or equipment. This is all basic road trader stuff after all. So the example given is an orc with a movement characteristic of four in mesh armor, which has a negative movement modifier of half an inch, dropping the orc's movement allowance down to three and a half inches, meaning the orc will use the MA3 chart, which I'm not sure is actually correct and maybe a typo, as there is an MA3 and a half inch chart. So, doors can be moved through without penalty unless locked, then consult the main rulebook. Models may not move through squares occupied by other models and are automatically engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat if in a square adjacent to an enemy model, unless the opposing player does not wish to engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Bearing in mind this is different to a charge, it's literally just being in proximity. Furnished and cluttered areas count as difficult ground, so half movement rate. Collapsed ceilings, dense wreckage or machinery count as very difficult terrain, so quarter movement rate with GM's discretion on impassable terrain. Unit coherency is expanded to being in the same room or enclosed space, or an adjoining space. Obstacles are treated the same as in the main rules, with half movement allowance to cross them. The second section covers shooting when using the floor plans. The facing and fire arc diagram shows clearly which squares can be targeted and that diagonal positioning of models is not allowed. Normal line of sight rules apply and the GM will determine if anything would block line of sight. 
Normal hiding and cover rules apply unless models are in adjacent squares and models can claim cover from doors or portals as per the diagram. Grenades and missiles have a change to the way they work. All grenades and missiles have an area of effect equal to the space that they are used in, i.e. only stopped by the walls of the room. Also, models within one square of an opening or doorway will be hit on a 4+. Plus. There is no deviation when firing at someone in the same space. I guess because everyone in that space will be hit anyway, so really you're attacking everyone in the room. Throwing or firing into an adjoining room is less certain, as you have to make sure the shot makes its way through the door or opening. This isn't done as a normal shot, but as a ballistic skill check on a D6, with a minus one modifier for each of the following. The doorway or opening is one inch or under. Through a window or hatch, and this can be increased at the GM's discretion, and firing at an angle of 45 degrees or more. If the roll is equal to the modified ballistic skill of the grenade or missile, it goes through into the adjoining room. If not, it explodes in the same room as the firer. A good way to utilise uh, the blast, increased blast radius of, of grenades and missiles would be to use gas grenades against unprotected enemy troops in the same space as yours. The building and damage section allows for walls to be attacked in one inch square areas rather than the four inch sections described in the main Rogue Trader rulebook. With the walls total damage being divided amongst the number of sections. Walls and doors are hit automatically by either shooting or hand-to-hand -hand combat. Once reduced to zero damage, they are breached and count as an obstacle to move over. Although there is no chance of collapse for doors, if two or more adjacent squares of wall section are breached, then roll a d6. If less than the number of adjacent breached sections is rolled, then the wall collapses and each model in the danger zone, as per the diagram, must make an armour save or be killed. Quite a fun idea is covered by the secret movement section. This covers the difficulties of tracking enemy movement in enclosed spaces, using what most of us would call blips. They suggest using one dummy blip for every two real blips. Blips are revealed when they fire or are fired upon. Dummy blips can't fire and are removed as soon as they are fired upon. The real blips are replaced with the actual models, just like Space Crusade or Space Hulk, but for both sides. A great suggested use is to have the defending force deployed first as tokens, with the attacking force using models and not being entirely sure of what they're up against. Then there's a pretty good passage of information that likens the mega cities of Judge Dread to the hive worlds of the Imperium, giving you the perfect setting in which to utilize the floor plans and environmental special rules in your games of 40k. It also mentions that space marines are often present on hive worlds as they are a rich source of recruitment. The last section provides a brief description of life in a hive city and also the gangs that populate them, providing several tables to roll up your own hive game for use in games of Warhammer 40k Rogue Trader. So I thought it'd be fun if we went to the tabletop and uh, rolled up our own hive game. First thing, naming the gang. The text states that hive gangs often adopt a name reflecting their environment or favoured fighting style, and recorded examples from the hive world of Telus 1501 included the Bad Rad Boys, the Metal Maniacs, the Screaming Scabs, and my favourite, the Zeta Death Phalangites. But on this occasion, we'll go with the name of the example gang, the Wasteland Warriors of Gamma Horgan 715. With the name sorted, we're on to gang size and organisation. Each gang is composed of a varying number of groups, each led by a personality model of hero status. For those of you that are unaware, in Rogue Trader, hero status means they'll have a champion, minor hero or major hero stat line. The number of groups can be determined by rolling a d4 plus 1. So let's give that a go. A total of two. In larger games, each group acts like a squad, but for small skirmish games, you can choose one group to fight. 
to generate the size of each group, you first generate the group leader. The status of the leader may give a modifier to the number of gangers that are in the group. We roll for the leader of group one. A roll of five, that equals a minor hero. I'll enter his name and stats on the roster sheet. Being a minor hero, Biff will add one to the dice roll for group size. Now we'll roll for the number of gangers in the group, adding the plus one from Biff's leader status. Bearing in mind the group size includes the leader. Let's roll. A total of two, which means seven gang members including Biff. There is a 10% chance for each ganger having champion stats. So I roll for each with the 10 on a d10 resulting in the ganger being a champion. Okay, so no champions this time. I'll now enter the supplied standard human profiles for each gang member. Weaponry is generated randomly, starting with an equal chance of either knife or sword. So uh, one to three knife, four to six a sword, uh, we'll go top to bottom. Then each gang member has a 50% chance of an antique pistol. So four plus on a D6 equals an antique pistol. Then onto the main chart using a D100 roll. The probability of items vary depending on the ganger's status. Each gang member gets to roll once on the missile weapon chart, with a roll of 91 or higher resulting in a roll on the special weapon subtable. So again, we'll go top to bottom. Not bad. Couple of shotguns, sawn off shotgun, stub gun, crossbow, and a bow. Only Slick rolled high enough to need the special weapon subtable. A roll of 77 resulted in blast grenades, an item which must have been dropped before Rogue Trader's final draft, as they are not in the rule book. So you could have some fun making up an effect for them. And lastly, the roll for armor, again, top to bottom. It seems armor's pretty hard to come by, resulting in just Zook getting flak armor and the leader Biff getting flak and a shield. So, quite a characterful gang, definitely leaning towards the Outlander's ratskin end of the spectrum. It's certainly very clear that at this early time in 40k's development, Hive gangs were considered to be very low-level criminal-type groups, uh, not the exotic and varied forces they would turn into in later years. You can then use the main Rogue Trader rulebook to work out points costs if you wish, and that just leaves the last thing, and that's the gang's visual style. And for that, I'll use the example given. The Wasteland Warriors favour spectacularly dyed hair and paint their clothing with the symbol of a hand holding a knife. All the inspiration you need to get painting. And there we have it, a Rogue Trader era hive gang to pit against another gang or local Imperial forces using the floor plans supplied in the box as the battlefield. Although I do have a fair amount of confrontation models, they're already equipped and armed for other uses, so I'm not going to attempt to create the Wasteland Warriors this time. But here I've proxied the Wasteland Warriors with my old school Necromunda Orlocks, set up to ambush some ultramarines who are guarding a valuable consignment about to be sent by monorail to a neighbouring hive city. Exactly the type of scenario Rogue Trader was designed to create. Thanks for watching, see you next time.